The goal of Christian instruction is to love God and to love your neighbour. Uh, and if your appreciation of doctrine is not driving you to that, then something has gone very wrong. And so it's about worship. It's not in the end about having all the right answers or being able to correct other people. The life of the Christian is a life of trust. And it's a life of being in the hands of your Heavenly Father and knowing that He is good and He is all powerful. And that in the end, whatever comes from His hand is for our good. Right from the very start, right from Genesis 3, one of the um, one of the great temptations of sin is that we believe that somehow there is a good that we're being denied. And um, I think when you reflect on the character of God and you know that it, his being is the most joyful, the best possible kind of being, he is ultimately fulfilled in every good thing. That's how he can be the source of every good thing. Um, and he is holy and he is righteous. And um, I just need to recognize the, the lie that sin could ever offer me anything good, that my life would ever be better in ultimate reality, that my life would ever be better for doing the wrong thing, for doing what God commands me not to do. There is a God who is working out his purpose from the very beginning to the very end. It is his world and he is supremely powerful and supremely good. Well, hello and uh, welcome to our Tron Church Talking Points podcast. And uh, we have a special this week. Uh, this week, uh, lots of us are at the Expository Ministry Conference, uh, hosted uh, here in our building and uh, it's Cornhill Scotland's annual conference where we have ministers from all around Scotland and even some from further afield. I think Pakistan and Zambia, uh, Canada. Uh, so it's a great occasion to gather together with other people who are in ministry or training for ministry. And uh, this week, I've been privileged uh, to have uh, Nick Tucker as one of our speakers. And uh, he's joining us uh, today on the podcast. So hello, Nick. Hello. <laughs> it's uh, lo lovely to have you with us. Um, Love to find out a little bit about you before we um, get into more meaty things. Sure. Um, so tell us what what it is you do, Nick. What's your what's your role at present? So I'm minister of a church on the south coast of England, uh, in a town called Hove, um, or as the locals call it, Hove. Actually, because they like to distinguish it from Brighton. Um, uh, I'm minister of a church called Bishop Hannington Memorial Church, uh, which is uh, we've been there nearly two years now. Um, it's just a lovely congregation of uh, godly people so um yeah i've never lived by the sea before either which is also very nice oh, lovely on the south coast as well so weather similar to glasgow probably it's, you know <laughs> a degree or two cooler <laughs> good and i'm guessing that isn't your first role in ministry no so um for seven years before that i worked in a church in birmingham uh, in the midlands of england uh, and then uh, before that, I spent eight years on the staff of Oak Hill Theological College in North London. Okay, so um, theology uh, into the, the pastorate, a yeah. uh, bit of a bit of a mix of things. Good, okay. Um, thinking about that, uh, how did you become a Christian or why did you become a Christian? How, how, did, how did that come about? So it's a funny thing. So my, um, my parents used to send me off to church when I was a kid, I think because I was very boisterous. And you know, a couple of hours piece a week was was welcomed. Um, and uh, I remember, and then I was a chorister in a in a very high Anglo Catholic church on the Welsh border. And um, I remember thinking there was something incredibly compelling about Jesus. Now, this is obviously as a small child, I wouldn't have used those terms, but um, but I, there was something incredibly compelling about Jesus and something very very profound. I could I could tell that there was something important about. Uh, and I always believed in God, I think, um, but it never, it never made any sense to me, and I couldn't really understand it. And I remember, <laughs> I remember watching the vicar preach and thinking, "How do you come up with something every week?" <laughs> that was basically what I was thinking whilst I was preaching: "Is your job's really hard? I mean, I wouldn't want to do that." Um, and we moved when I was eleven to Oxford. Uh, my dad's a teacher, and he moved to a school there, and. Um, I wanted to go to church. I didn't really know why, but I wanted to go to church. And um, 
So my mum took me along to the University Church of St Mary the Virgin in, in Oxford, which is the sort of, you know, the church that the Dons and others kind of go to. And um, I quickly realised it wasn't for me when the only after-service refreshments available turned out to be sherry. <laughs> and my mum wouldn't let me have any because I was 11. And, um, <laughs> so uh, I had a friend at school who went to a church in North Oxford called St Andrews. And uh, I went along uh, there with him just to see what it was like because I wanted to go to somewhere where there were young people. I was the only kid when I went to St Mary's. So I went along with him. Uh, I was absolutely thrilled to discover that there were girls there. So I kept going. Um, cause I, was, I was an all boys school, you see, so I never saw girls ever. Um, and, um, and then after a year or two, there was a, um, a, a, a sort of pathfinder camp, you know, a camp for 11 to 13 year olds. Uh, and we went away to a school in Devon somewhere. And, um, a fireman called Jeff just did a, a sort of very basic gospel presentation, this image of a kind of unbridgeable chasm and, and, Jeff described it as, you can't jump across between that gap between us and God. He said, you can't jump across that. Uh, and I loved jumping. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, that's terrible. I can't get that. I can't, something I can't jump. Um, and, and then he laid across, uh, he had a sort of paper cross they'd cut out and he put it across that gap and, uh, you know, bridging that chasm of sin between us and, and God. And, uh, and finally, everything that I'd ever heard in church suddenly made sense. Hmm. And um, I thought, Yes, this is what's missing in my life. Hmm. I mean, what twelve-year-old thinks about what's missing in their lives, I don't know. But you know, that's huh. that's how I remember it. Um, hmm. I thought I can actually have a relationship with God. This is what it's all about. Hmm. Um, yeah, and that was the start. Fantastic. There's sometimes I think we can take for granted or lose sight of how wonderful it is that actually the way the Lord leads people to the Lord Jesus is through the gospel. It's not. Yeah. It's not. It's not anything particularly fancy. It it actually is explaining, unpacking. This is the yeah. significance of yeah. Christ. And I'd been exposed to kind of Christian language and symbols and um, and things all my life. But but actually it was just that simple explanation that just everything then just sort of folded into place. It was hmm. an extraordinarily powerful experience. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, fantastic. And it, felt, it feels almost like everything that came before that was preparation for that moment, you know. Hmm. So, yeah. ah. so uh, there you go. Sending, sending boisterous boys off to off to church can yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wonderful ministry strategy. Isn't it? <laughs> Good. And tell us then, Nick, how how did you end up in ministry? How did that become the the path? How did you end up doing the job? You thought, oh, that's really hard. Yeah. So my my resistance to the idea only grew through my teens. So um, as I said, I was an all boys school. You know, I kind of, after that summer, I kind of came back and I was busily telling everyone, you know, I was a Christian now and this is so exciting. And so, of course, their immediate reaction was, oh, you're going to be a vicar. <laughs> um, which is the last thing I'd ever wanted to be anyway. But I'm, I'm I suppose, sometimes quite oppositional. And I, I just, there's absolutely no way you're telling me what I'm going to be. Um, and I was, uh, I was kind of absolutely dead set. I was going to go and uh, join the Royal Marines. Um uh, and I was in the process, I got into the process of asking them to, to sponsor me through university. They sent me on a parachuting course, which was just unalloyed bliss. It was wonderful. Yeah. Um, and then um, not long after I came back from that, uh, I had a conversation with uh, my youth leader at the time. He, he said, have you ever thought about going into ministry? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I don't feel called. I thought I had the trump card. Uh, and he said, mm, that's really interesting. <laughs> uh, and the conversation went on from there. And I, was, I, I continued to resist for a while until there was one evening we had the, the youth group, was the sort of older kids in the youth group were together, sort of 17, 18 year olds. And um, we, uh, for some reason, we were asked to split into pairs and talk about what we thought we would be kind of when we grew up, you know, where, where, where was the Lord going to take us? Uh, and I, I was talking to this young woman and I said, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think I'm going to be a vicar. I think I'm going to be a minister in the church. And she said, that's extraordinary. I can't believe it either because I think I'm going to be a vicar's wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, I think she actually is married to, to someone who's in ministry. But I thought you were going to say, and it was your, it's not your wife. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be a story? No, no, no. And, and both of us sort of looked at each other and went, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it was, there was kind of a moment where I think I kind of gave in. I think the Lord had been prompting me, um, you know, to... to to spend what he'd given me on 
on, mm. on his service. So, uh, and and for me that I think you know that was the right thing. So I went off to university. I had been planning to study medicine, changed to biochemistry because that was the closest thing I could find to medicine without asking the government to train me for a job I was never going to do. Uh, and um, but I I basically went knowing that's where I wanted to end up. So I worked, mm. I, I, when I graduated, I worked for UCCF for four years and then went off to train at Oak Hill. So that's how it started. And Oak Hill for a long time then at Oak Hill? When I, so I did four years as a student and went off and did a, a sort of associate minister job for mm. three years. But I couldn't quite escape the gravitational pull of the college and ended up back there. Yeah. Mm. So. Good. That's uh, Well, so the boy who loved uh, jumping... Got to jump out of planes and give it yeah, up. It great. <laughs> yeah. oh, fantastic. Well, we're we've been pleased so far that you have uh, stepped into ministry and you've been been helping us uh, this week. Um, but uh, moving from the pastors upstairs to um, just folks in our congregation, uh, give us a g- give them a, a little taste, a little flavour of what it is you're, you'll be teaching us and you have been teaching us this week. So uh, the task I've been assigned is to, to talk about teaching doctrine in expository ministry. Uh, and really, doctrine is, is the idea of uh, a sort of Christian framework of, of teaching uh, that shapes our, our minds and our hearts. And um, so I've been talking about the value of doing that and the value of, of, of teaching uh, sort of things to believe and things to know and understand about God and about ourselves and about the world and, you know, history and, and all those sorts of things to it, the, the sort of image I've used is, is the idea of, of sort of seeing the world through Christian spectacles. Mm. So, um, you know, moving from the sort of reading and understanding of scripture to actually developing a Christian mind, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. Good. And, it, and it's been helpful. I think it, it, it is a very important uh, thing to get in right perspective as well. So, um, you, you, you quoted from, from Calvin's stuff in the institutes and I'd, I'd heard this before, um, that actually the whole the whole reason he wrote the institutes uh, was so that he could, in a sense, get on with teaching the Bible. Yeah. And so it, actually, he's the vast majority of his works are commentaries and sermons and all the rest. But he's probably best known for the institutes. But it it wasn't he didn't see, he didn't see that as the great achievement of his of his ministry. Mm-hmm. There's actually a, a foundation to help people. Yeah, I think to sort of sit alongside the exposition of scripture to help those who are training to do that, but also to help those who are reading the Bible for themselves to, to be able to put what they were reading into context. So one of the um, sort of big kind of emphases of uh, of the early reformers that I talked about in the session was, was, was the idea that we have to interpret scripture by scripture. And obviously in order to do that, we need to know what's in mm-hmm. the whole Bible and have a sense of how it fits together so that when we come to difficult things in the Bible, we don't go off on a tangent somewhere but actually read it in the light of everything else that God has revealed to us in his word in his whole counsel yes and so you're going to be you're going to be a big believer that actually Christians generally need to have uh, some some sense of a developed understanding of, of of doctrine of what the bible teaches on things Yes, you're correct in that assumption. <laughs> and, and so, but sometimes um, Christians might have a, a bit of an aversion to doctrine, think, oh, it's, it's dusty, it's a bit, yeah. uh, it's not, not for me. Or perhaps um, maybe slightly uh, misunderstanding expository uh, preaching and all the rest. Well, we're not really interested in doctrine, we're just interested in teaching the Bible. Mm. Um, that's an error in one direction. Talk a little bit about, about, about that and why that's so um, uh, mistaken. Well, one of the goals of teaching the Bible is to teach us about God, one another is to teach us about ourselves. Um, and, and I suppose we're all sort of interested, we, as, as teachers of the Bible, we're kind of hoping that some of it sticks. And I suppose that's what Christian doctrine is really, is, mm. is that picture building up. Now, I do think that there's real value in doing that in a deliberate way and, and in sort of saying, well, look, this piece goes here and this piece goes here. Um, but that is for good or for ill, we either have a good doctrine or we have a, an erroneous one. Yes. And the process of Christian discipleship and maturity is kind of fueled by, you know, replacing false ideas about God with true ones. Um, so it's, it's, that's, it's not in opposition to ex- expositional meeting. In some ways it's, uh, preaching rather, sorry, it's more that it's part of the goal of expo- expositional preaching. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm sure there are, it, it's right to say that there are times when, when it's helpful to, 
to more deliberately say, well, we're going to just put some of these pieces in place uh, and say so we're going to teach what the whole Bible says about this, which is obviously is an enormous task, but you know that's part of the task of the Christian teacher, I think. Yes, and I, I guess church church to church that'll look differently if if you've got a fairly mature congregation. Yeah, that that's maybe going to be less necessary in a more regular sense. But actually, if you've got lots of new Christians, they probably don't have much of a developed understanding of of the whole. What does the what does the Bible actually say? With any particular issue? No, indeed, unless, unless it's your sort of theology professors who are getting converted. But um, <laughs> but even then, uh, yeah. uh, uh, but but yes, I think I think that's I think that's right. That there is, uh, you know, and, and you know, from from earliest times and through the Reformation as well, there was a, a very important role that the church saw for what it called catechesis. You know, the sort of basic Christian mm. instruction, um, and I think we must have an eye to that for for people who are coming to know the Lord. Um, we, we, we all carry around in our in our heads all kinds of ideas about God that are far from what he's really like. Uh, and um, there are some sort of basic things that we can, you know, put in place that really help with that. And then that then helps us in our reading of scripture to know that, well, when Jesus uses the word God, this is what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I've, uh, I have a friend uh, in ministry who... Um, uh, his wife was was catechized growing up, mm. and uh, he he said he discovered after a while that um, she just had an instinct when she read something or heard something which, mm, that doesn't sound right. And uh, I think one one of the phrases we use for that kind of thing around here is it, it's developed um, a growing appreciation of doctrine and understanding all these things. Actually, it gives you a the how to smell a rat instinct. Yes, and that's exactly what Paul says in Ephesians four. So. You know, the, the, the goal of pastors and teachers is to build, you know, is so that the body can be built up for works of service. But that happens as the body achieves unity in, in the faith. Mm. Uh, and he says, then we'll become mature and we won't be blown around by every wind of doctrine. So that's exactly it. It, it, it is developing that sort of sense of, mm, that doesn't sound right. Which is exactly what, what Paul says we're supposed to be doing, is giving people that that sort of foundation which is not easily shaken and it's not necessarily that you'll be able to unpick just exactly why it is but actually that instinct's quite important to just think i might ask someone about that book yes. or i'm just not sure about this youtube video yeah right yeah yeah. Um, but it so actually the, the more we read good books the more we're actually able to understand which books are good and which ones maybe we shouldn't be reading or uh, likewise with listening to sermons and yes. lectures and all these sorts of things. Absolutely. Back in the day when banknotes were really a thing, I heard a story about um, uh, bank tellers being trained in how to spot a forgery, you know, yes. this. And um, and basically they were just given loads of real notes to handle. And then when they saw a forgery, they knew instantly because mm -hmm. they knew exactly what a real banknote felt like, smelt like, looked like. Mm. Um, and it's I think it's just, just that, yeah. Mm. That's all. So that that's an error in one in one direction um, of kind of not appreciating um, doctrine uh, at all, sort of being that's not for me. But there probably can be a, a danger in the other direction that people, in a sense, love um, love doctrine and live for doctrine, and um, being sound is, is is what's quite important. And um, they might be the sort of folks who would um, like to hit people over the head with doctrine uh, in churches. Yeah. Any any thoughts on on that? The goal of Christian instruction is to love God mm. and to love your neighbour. Uh, and if your appreciation of doctrine is not driving you to that, then something has gone very wrong. Mm. Um, the, 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 the basic diet of the Christian is scripture. Um, I think the Bible makes that very clear. You know, um, we talk about Amos 8 and the sort of hor horrific idea of a mm. famine of the word of God. Uh, and people staggering across across the land looking for the word of God but not finding it. And um, if if what I'm interested in is building up my system rather than hearing God speak to me in his word and responding with love and worship and obedience, then something's gone very seriously wrong in my Christian life. Uh, and that's when you end up, I think, with dry orthodoxy or with intellectual pride. I am not saved by what I know. Mm -hmm. I am saved by who I know. Mm. Um, and ultimately the goal of Christian doctrine is to relate rightly to the God who made us. So it's about worship. It's not in the end about having all the right answers or being able to correct other people. Although, you know, sometimes correction is useful mm. and necessary. Mm. But but that's, you know, if I, it, it is so 
the car hearts are so simple, aren't they? Mm. You know, we're we're always, you, you know, in, in another matter. Luther talked about, you know, um, being like a, a sort of drunk person trying to get on a horse, yeah. and just always falling off one side or the other. So I think we have to recognise that that's that's you know we're always going to whatever it is we're faced with, we're, we're always at risk of just falling one way or the other way. Mm. Um, and yeah, I'm sure there have been times in my life where I've been much more interested in being the person who knows the answers than being the person who knows the Lord. Mm, mm. Um, and that is, well, I mean, well, that's just a grievous thing, isn't it? You know, mm. when I could be, you know, sort of reveling in my own little corner of, like, cleverness, when I I could be worshipping the God who made me, which is what I was made for. So, yeah. That's right, yes. A, a, a flawed theology is, is absolutely exposed when you realise I'm not looking at the wonders of God and acting in accordance with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I suppose... Uh, yeah, I, I'm just thinking about, you know, as far as I can see, you know, theologically, Jesus sided with the Pharisees quite frequently, <laughs> mm. particularly against the Sadducees, and yet they were far from God. Mm. Um, so you can know the right things, you can know what are the right things to believe, and still be far from yes. the Lord. So. Well, the demons had great theology. Brilliant, yeah. <laughs> the devil knows his Bible better than you do. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. Well, on on the theme of doctrine, you've written uh, a book. You've written a book on, uh, on doctrine. Um, it may it may become a Tron Church read at some point. Who knows? That's who knows? Um <laughs> But it's called 12 Things God Can't Do." A slightly provocative title um, about uh, doctrine of God things, but but I think really the beauty of it is in the the subtitle um, and how that can help us to sleep at night. So uh, talk a little bit a little bit about that, and, and actually. I think this book's excellent in landing doctrine in uh, in life and why actually why it's um, yeah. why it is a comfort. Um, and I'll ask you a few scenarios uh, to, to unpack okay. for us in a moment or two. But just first, that that subtitle is, is just so so profound, actually. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm very struck by in the Psalms, God doesn't sleep, but the fact that God is watching over you means that you can sleep. And um, you know, so it's not randomly plucked from the air, but I think basically the life of the Christian is a life of trust mm. and it's a life of being in the hands of your Heavenly Father and knowing that he is good and he is all-powerful and that in the end whatever comes from his hand is for our good. Uh, and for me that landed very personally, um, say, many years ago now, but uh, when he was 30 my younger brother died very suddenly a heart attack when he was on his honeymoon <laughs> and I mean you, you sort of tempted to say there's nothing that can prepare you for something like that but actually there is um, in, in, in one sense at least which is that the, the, the first place I went to in my head and my heart was well you know who is God on the day that this has happened mm. you know, what do I know about God what, what, what is true you know how can I preach the gospel to myself uh, and I just found that it was actually my doctrine of, of God that, that kind of gave me a, an anchor in that. Mm. Um, knowing that there was a day coming when I'd look him in the eye and know that he'd never put a foot wrong, mm. that he was perfectly, purely, fully good, and that he's working good in every circumstance for, for the sake of those who love him. Um, so, you know, in that sense, I think part, partly I wanted to... I, I mean, it started off originally as as a series of talks that I gave at were live. But um, what I wanted people to be able to share was that sense of God's greatness that kind of gives you a firm foundation for for life. And and knowing that you know, in vain you stay up late and get up early. You know, it's the Lord who builds mm -hmm. the house. And um, and I wanted to sort of share that sense that the greatness of God is the thing that really underpins a life of trust and a life of being able to sleep at night mm. uh, and a life where, you you know, Jesus says, come to me and you can rest. So um, the, the reason for sort of focusing on things that God can't do is that there are many things that um, can only really ex be expressed about God from our point of view negatively. Mm. Um, and there are other things which take on a, a so you know God can't suffer, God can't die, um, but also things like um, 
in, in terms of thinking about God's knowledge, that actually thinking about the fact that, well, actually God's knowledge is such that he cannot learn. Mm. Uh, and not only is God's knowledge bigger than mine, but it's different. Mm. So God knows the universe by creating it, not by observing it. And then that, that sort of thing then begins to work on my, maybe it's just my particular imagination, but I think that begins to work on my imagination to make me think, oh, wow, God is bigger than I imagined. He is mm. greater than I imagined. Mm. He's not like me. Mm. He's not just me kind of expanded up, you know, to a much bigger, better version. He is, mm. he's a different kind of being. He's my creator, not, not, mm. not just someone like me. That's, yeah. that's so helpful to get the, the, the sort of creator creature distinction. Yeah. We're not, we're not just like God, but smaller. And he's not just like, he's not the big man. Yeah. Um, but, but wholly other. And actually, even for us to know him at all is him accommodating. Yes. Um, to yeah, us, yeah. like, was it Calvin says that, like a mother lisping to her baby. Mm -hmm. um, that Even that's the only way we can know him. Yes. So, so, so great as he compared, yeah. uh, compared to us. The other thing I wanted to, to, to try to sort of develop in the book was just how extraordinary the gospel is then given who God is. Mm -hmm. So that the son of God who cannot die found a way to die for me. Yeah. You know, we, we think of it, I think often as Christians, we, we're kind of used to the idea, mm. but it's so outrageous. It is just so shocking when you think about well, this is God doing this. Um, and, and I wanted to sort of put those two things together a bit. Uh, and part of the way that, knowing the greatness of God helps me to sleep at night is knowing what he's done for me. Mm -hmm. He's shown me love in a way that I just, I will spend eternity trying to come to terms with. Mm. You know, I think, you know, the angels long to look into that. Yes. And um, so that's, that's the aim of it. And, and really it, it is, it is, the hope is that in reading it, I have had people come to me and say, oh, yeah, I fell asleep last night <laughs> for the first time in years. You know, oh, so, wow. so there are, there are, you mm. know, I think, I'm not promising. I'll, I'll look to the camera. I am not promising that reading this book will help you to sleep. It might put you to sleep. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it, 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 it can actually, mm. engaging with God in this way, can mm. actually give us a, a, a peace and a restfulness that is so often elusive in mm. this rather seemingly chaotic and, and, and brutal world. Yes. Well, it, that is the key ultimately relying and looking to and understanding God's character I think particularly in, in times where things are are difficult where you've had um, a terrible diagnosis mm. or someone you love yeah. has or um, there's just an unbearable burden that, that that's come into your path yeah um, actually knowing God hasn't fallen asleep he's not asleep at the wheel here yeah <laughs> um yeah. he's he's ultimately in control and good yeah. and Actually, in a sense, all, all, all the other, you know, he's the fact that it, we can't see him, that the, his invisibility means yes. he's everywhere. Yeah. It's not, oh, he must have, he must have got caught the other side of the world for this to have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. All, all very reassuring. Um, Isn't it? Mm. It's, it's good. Um, well, I, I, so we, you've covered a little bit there on um, uh, how actually a, a, an understanding of the doctrine of God helps with, with suffering, mm -hmm. personal personal example for yourself. I wonder how uh, any um, kind of aspects of, uh, of adoption of God that you would point us to that would help us persevere with ministry, persevere with evangelism, wanting to win people um, to Christ and dealing with the opprobrium that comes with being faithful to him. So I think remembering that, that God is the centre of reality, that everything that has ever happened is about him in some way. Mm. You know, Paul talks about how everything was made through Christ and for Christ. So actually, I think that's really helpful. Um, I had a friend who was a Marxist when he was at university. He said the thing that Marxism, the really attractive thing about it was it gave me a sense of history. It gave me a, a way to make sense of history. Well, this is a much greater way to make sense of mm -hmm. history. There is, there is a God who is working out his purpose from very beginning to the very end. It is his world. And he is supremely powerful and supremely good. Mm. So for, for those in ministry who are kind of wanting to, you know, fuel to keep going, it's quite helpful to know that actually you are on the right side of history. Mm. Uh, to coin a phrase, you, you really are doing the greatest thing that is 
possible to do, which is, you know, giving your life to the service of, of God. You're doing that in a very particular way. People can do that in all walks of life. But, you know, if you've been called into this walk of life, if God has led you there, um, there's nothing better you could be doing. Uh, because this is the story that matters. This is the story the angels will sing about for eternity. You know, this is this is where it's really at. Um, and in the midst of it all, you know, God has found a way, though he cannot suffer in his own nature, has found a way to suffer along with us mm. and, and, and has given his son, you know, in order to achieve this, in, in order that people could come into his kingdom. Mm. Now, if God is so supreme and so good and so holy and he thinks that people coming into his kingdom is worth that mm. there's not i've got nothing that's of any kind of comparable value you know that i could hold back so i think i think just sort of you know that big picture that sort of zooming out mm. and and, mm. and thinking about just the greatness of god the grandeur of god the fact that even if People think what you're doing is ridiculous and a waste of your life. And, you know, I've had people say that to me. Um, it's not. Mm. There, there is nothing greater than to know God and to serve him. Mm. That's what we were made for. Yes. That's helpful. And I think the, uh, is it chapter three, God can't change his mind. Yeah. His commitment to actually what he's doing in the world. Yeah. Um, that's a wonderful, he's promised something. Yeah. It will happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's a, it's a striking thing, isn't it, that the very beginning of the story is 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 reality rushing to catch up with what God has to say. Mm. You know, so God speaks, he says, let there be light, and there is light. You know, God's word is that true, that reality cannot resist it. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, when God makes a promise, he's not giving up on it. Mm. So, um, yeah, he's... I, I, I've been sort of reflecting on sort of 2 Peter 3 and, and that sort of mm. where, where Peter says God is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness and I think just you know but he's patient with you not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to salvation and you think okay that's also a really helpful way to look at mm. the world isn't it when you're you know and particularly when ministry is hard and sometimes ministry is really hard is is actually to know that you know actually the, the reason it's not all over <laughs> Is, is that mm. there are people God still wants to save and he's mm. going to do it. So carry on because some of them are around you. Yes. God's patience is worth reflecting on, isn't it? Isn't I, it? Uh, yeah. There's a, there's a phrase, I just loved uh, a line in the book, um, God never work, it wakes up in a bad mood, <laughs> changes his mind, lashes yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, that, that is, what an unbelievable comfort from someone who sometimes wakes up in a bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> Um, good. That, that that that's uh, that's encouraging. Uh, a sort of final um, scenario, in a sense. Thinking, how does thinking about uh, doctrine of God, think about who God is, um, and his character. How does that? How can that spur us on, encourage us, help us when we're just wanting to live the faithful Christian life? We're battling with sin, yeah. the world, the flesh, the devil. Um, I think. I think. Right from the very start, right from Genesis three, one of the um, one of the great temptations of sin is that we believe that somehow there is a good that we're being denied, and um, I think when you reflect on the character of God and you know that it, it, His being is the most joyful, the best possible kind of being, He is ultimately fulfilled in every good thing. Mm. That's how He can be the source of every good thing. Um, and he is holy and he is righteous. And um, I just need to recognize the, the lie that sin could ever offer me anything good, that my life would ever be better in ultimate reality, that my life would ever be better for doing the wrong thing, for doing what God mm. commands me not to do, uh, or indeed for not doing what commands me, God, God commands me to do. Um, so, so I think just reflecting on the fact that God is ultimately good, the best kind of existence is to share in his goodness. Um, if I live a life of obedience, I'm beginning to live the life of heaven now. I'm beginning to live the only way it is possible to live in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, every time I choose disobedience, I'm denying the reality of who God has made me to be mm -hmm. because I'm actually denying the reality of who he is. So um, 
and saying he's not good, he won't he won't keep his word, you know, mm. he's uh, he's not powerful, you know, to sin is to, to act as if God is not God, isn't it? So um, that helps me. Mm. Mm. I when I was when I was growing up, I I, I would often hear a talk on. Um, you know, living a godly Christian life as being the cost of discipleship. Mm. Hmm. The cost of discipleship, no, it's the benefit. Mm. That's right, yeah. You know, there is, there is no better life than the life dedicated to God and lived in obedience to him. Mm. You know, I have to preach that to myself every day because there is a big part of my heart that thinks, no, that's rubbish. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know better. <laughs> you can make much better decisions than God can. Um but but actually, you know, a godly life is a benefit of the gospel. Because it's actually it's picturing what eternity is going to be yeah. like. What do you think what, you're going to do in heaven? There'll be no there'll be no sin. There'll be no temptation to it. No. And actually, we'll yeah. in a sense be um, living out all the um, what the law would picture. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, what it, yeah. There, there, we, there'll be no more needs to say thou shalt not murder because yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely, because we will be like him, for we will see him mm, as he is. Mm, yeah. Mm. Good. Um, just, just to finish, um, uh, encouragement to, to me, helpful to me in in fighting, continue to fight the Christian life. I, I just find it so helpful. The your chapter that God can't learn, not because he's deficient, but because what's he got to learn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but very often that. The way that's applied and is applied very helpfully is so he isn't taken by surprise mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a comfort when things are perhaps difficult mm -hmm. um, but you also just um, landed it in as well on it means he can't it means our sin doesn't take him by surprise yeah he he's he's actually fully aware of every last degree of it um, and yet still he stepped into history in the person of the lord jesus yeah. in order to, to to redeem that um i, I find that a tremendous <laughs> Convic it's convicting too. Yes. Um, no hiding. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but also a wonderful, um, a wonderful comfort that actually, I can't. Uh, my sin can't outdo His grace. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so that is a comfort, isn't it? Mm. Well, Nick, thank you, thank you so much uh, for your your time. Uh, I'm sure our listeners will have uh, benefited from from hearing you on this, and uh, I do commend uh, to you. Uh, uh, next book, 12 Things God Can't Do. Uh, I'm sure you'll find lots of uh, really helpful and, and uh, comforting um, things for that for now. And who knows, uh, down into the future as well, what, what might happen. So it's good, to, it's good to reflect on who God is and what he's like. So thanks, Nick, and uh, go well for the rest of the conference. Thank you.